Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit, as you can see in the title, on um, the issue of um, research study populations and how uh, the importance of community engagement to help address diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this cartoon here illustrates how some individuals feel when they participate in research, potentially. And the question is, if study participants are subjects, where is the humanity in, in human research? Um, nobody wants to be a study subject. I don't think uh, what uh, study participants want is to be informed uh, volunteer participants that contribute to, to the greater wood good, I'm sorry. And um, we have certainly found that in, in, in some of the dialogues, the many dialogues we've had uh, with a variety of, of different uh, study participants. So to many, research may in fact feel, feel like this. Um, as you can see there in, in the back, uh, you have the study participant in a jar being worked on, as it were. Uh, this the institutional review board providing some oversight. And really, the, the institutional review board is there to protect uh, individuals and make sure that, that their participation is voluntary and so on. And then way in the background, in terms of uh, pharmaceutical um, or therapeutic studies, you have the Food and Drug Administration also kind of looking in the back. Uh, so yes, you could have this feeling that, that you're being watched. But while it, research may feel like this, in reality, um, it should be about this. It should be about broad participation. And this circle of individuals working towards a common uh, good, the, the idea, the, the, the accomplishment that's trying to be reached, Everything from therapeutics, uh, devices, in terms of clinical, to better um, health promotion and prevention activities, interventions, and so on. Um, this circle of individuals should include everybody, the investigators, actual participants, um, the community as a whole. So it should feel a little bit like that, this broad participation. Um, it should be diverse discovery, right? Uh, putting together this puzzle that we're all a part of, because ultimately, um, it doesn't matter, even bench scientists, uh, basic scientists who are working with tissue, with animals, ultimately, uh, the idea is that their work is going to benefit human beings, more or less, right? Or somewhere in that, in that pipeline of discovery. And the more diversity we have in that, whether it's gender, race, uh, ethnicity, um, social, sexual and social orientation, and so on, um, these are all important elements. And... Ultimately, when the information is gathered, having broad dissemination, um, what you, certainly on the academic side, you, what happens is down here at the bottom, right? You have presentations and scientific meetings. These are kind of like the initial results. And then eventually you have publications, peer reviewed publications uh, in a variety of journals. And, but this other part on the top here, which um, I call basically practice dissemination, has to do with getting the results to community and, and, and getting it to community in a form that's understandable. Even this, these graphics that may appear very confusing are actually probably more understandable in terms of the things that are healthy versus unhealthy uh, for us. Uh, everything from uh, cardiovascular movement, eating right, uh, being the appropriate weight, uh, physical activity and so on versus the bad things, right? Tobacco, the number one preventable cause of disease in the world, the use of therapeutic accessible alcohol, and so on. So um, this broad dissemination and appropriate vehicles and content is, is very important in, in the work that we are doing. So um, this is an example is one um, knowledge transfer approach. This looks a little bit complicated, but at the end of the day, the take home message here really is that it's very important to have the uh, stakeholder, a stakeholder identified problem. That, what that means is that the, the issues that you're trying to address has input from the individuals that it's gonna impact the most. And you'd be surprised. Um, one of the key issues right here with regards to the question and methods is that most research questions don't have stakeholder input. The questions and the, and the study aims or so on are being developed by academics. And that's pretty much it. So an approach that, that includes others within that process is very important. And up here, you have 
academic dissemination, right? The, the, the publications and so on. But if you move down to the bottom section, the knowledge transfer that occurs down here, the contextualization of knowledge, this, these other dissemination components, those other little graphics that we just saw in the upper right, the application of that knowledge, and then assessing the impact um, of that knowledge along that continuum um, is, is very important. So this translation approach. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, these four things in a little bit more depth. Um, so a review of the challenges that some investigators face in recruiting and retaining diverse study participants, the implications for interpreting and applying results, and exploring how community-engaged research approaches can um, help prevent and address issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and health research. Um, so in terms of the challenge, and this will all be fairly, you know, fairly quick, I, I hope that um, this will spur some questions, uh, develop some questions, and, and we'll have a, a robust conversation and get into a little more detail depending on, on your interests. So challenges. Some investigators um, have these these issues with recruiting of certain cultural, racial, ethnic groups, and so on, often this is largely because of a lack of community-engaged research training. It's a capacity issue. And that training isn't just for, for the principal investigator, you know, the faculty, but it's also for the, the staff that, that is largely responsible for the, you know, the recruitment and retention of, of participants. Um, trainees, whether it's um, professional trainees, postdocs, and so on, or, or, or other students, there is a lack of infrastructure to develop that, that capacity. Often, we're missing language and cultural concordance with regards to a variety of populations here in the, in the San Diego, along the border, and so the San Diego region, uh, the border region, you have a lot of immigrants, a lot of uh, bilingual and monolingual Spanish speakers. In, in other parts of the, of the country, um, you have a lot of other different cultures. Um, so the culture and the language of the, of the populations you're trying to work with, having the, you know, leadership that understands the culture and the language, it speaks the language, uh, and or staff is very, very important. And, and this goes a long way in terms of knowing um, how to address the issues of recruitment and retention with regards to, to studies. Uh, and not applying the golden rule. So we'll get a little bit into, into that. Um, the lack of community-engaged research training in particular, there are actually some key principles which we will talk about. Uh, I'll bring up a little bit later in terms of what those exactly are. But using very specific frameworks and principles that exist um, are, it is very important related to community-engaged research and having uh, those end recipients, those stakeholders involved. Um, missing language and cultural concordance it really is about the team, as I mentioned. Uh, who are the leaders and uh, the principal investigators in particular? What kind of experience do they have in working with specific types of populations? If you uh, are doing a study with women and the men, and it's only men in as principal investigator and so on and so forth, um, I think you're going to have some issues. I, for example, am part of a, a national consortium called PLUS, Preventing Lower Urinary Tract Symptoms in Women. Uh, that's trying to define what bladder health is for women. And guess what? The principal investigators are pretty much women. I was brought in for my expertise in working with Latina women in particular. I'm not a woman. I'm not a Latina woman. But, um, and I wasn't part of the focus groups, for example, that were done initially. But my experience culturally, linguistically has contributed significantly to that team. Um, and that was one of the thing, you know, one of the things that I contributed uh, was brought on to do. So who are the leaders? Uh, and who represents the study participants in their communities? Uh, do those folks have a seat at the table? Um, the community advisory board approach, for example, where you bring a group of people, um, can only go so far, right? Um, and, and they meet quarterly often with, with a team. They're not necessarily part of the team. So the language and cultural concordance has to be kind of built in into this process. The, the golden rule. Um, I do believe in the adage that when it comes to investigation and life in general, I mean, you do want to others as you would want them to do unto you. You want to treat others the way you want to be treated. And it's the same kind of thing. Uh, I think many of us have, particularly now with COVID, um, have been exposed to the subtle, well, not, not, in some cases, not subtleties, but if you have an, an emergency room visit, you see how stressed everybody is there. And sometimes 
you don't get answers uh, when you want answers or when you need answers to be able to pass on to family. And as a study participant, it, it could be the same kind of issue. You know, you're not making an informed decision. Um, I would not be surprised that, particularly in therapeutic studies where, where medicines or devices are involved, um, I would not be surprised if individuals do not know what they're signing up for in terms of the detail. And particularly if they're from different cultures uh, uh, and speak different languages, they may not be fully consented and be fully volunteer, informed volunteer participants. So following the golden rule and really thinking through, if you were sitting there as a, as a study participant, what would you want to receive? Obviously the obvious things, you know, being treated with respect um, and so on, but really being informed of what it is that you're getting into. The implications for interpreting and applying um, results, there are two things that I, that I think are particularly important. One is the scientific term of generalizability, which basically gets into um, the design issues in a study where you can speak to broad populations. And this is where randomization uh, comes in of individuals that are being selected, but we won't get into all those design issues. But one of the things that's very important is uh, and this is a, this is an example uh, out of um, from Nature, um, the journal Nature, um, on how some of our most um, advanced work that's happening right now, everything having to do with omics and genetics and so on, how some of these larger studies that are being conducted do not have racial ethnic diversity. Uh, pay attention to this red bar uh, with regards to. Um, some of the major genetic um, attributed studies that are that have been taking place, the majority of participants in those studies are of European descent. In this case, um, 78%. When you look at um, populations that are particularly important to our region, for example, Hispanic Latinos, 1%. Uh, in other areas, um, African descent and so on, 2%. You know, Asian Pacific Islander, another very, very large group um, in our area. 10%. You know, this really has huge impacts in terms of um, generalizability and what you can say about populations outside of European descent with regards to um, genetic diversity in those data that are being collected. The other issue is timeliness. Um, there's quite a bit of, of dialogue that has happened in the last decade, I would say, about um, this very, very long process of where you began a research study to the point that you actually end up with some practice relevant information. Um, and the average is about a 17 year process, which is an incredibly long time. And we're gonna get a little bit into that, but basically part of this has to do with, again, this issue of the focus of the research, not really taking communities and stakeholders into account in, from the get go in terms of those questions so that you're really addressing and developing information that is relevant to those individuals and communities uh, in a more applied way. And that's how you get into a lot of these, these time lags. There obviously are other complexities in terms of the, the, the funders and, and, and the approaches that are being used in, in, in science and discovery, which are lengthy. But I would make the case that not having uh, community stakeholders actively engaged from the, from the beginning does impact the kind of information that is being collected. So in terms of some of the approaches for community-engaged research um, that can actually help prevent um, inequities and address diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, as a researcher, if you are involved in research and you're involved in anything related to the community, you've heard of CDPR, which is community-based participatory research. This is, a, this is an approach that um, really takes into consideration the green and purple elements that you can see here. The more traditional approaches are over here on the left where, uh, and I won't go into all of this, you can read, but basically the researcher defines the problem versus on the full community-based participatory research where the community identifies a problem and works with the research um, um, or works with the, with, uh, with the researcher to identify a problem. Again, that 17 year lag um, is really shortened because if it's a five year grant, you already are addressing um, issues that are relevant to the community and gathering information that will hopefully have um, some of the elements that are necessary to have impact locally. Um, and as you move down this list, 
the focus, for example, down here, another thing to, to look at is um, the information itself. This is on the dissemination end, right? So researchers own the data in the traditional model. They control the use and the dissemination versus on the community-based participatory research approach where data are shared, and that should be R, not is, where data are shared um, and researchers and community decide its use and dissemination. This is particularly important in communities, in smaller communities, where they value their sovereignty. Typically, American Indian communities, for example, uh, have various layers um, in there in terms of review because you can identify the community and the individuals within that community, which gets into all kinds of ethics um, and, um, and a variety of, of other confidentiality issues in regards to population or even individual participants. So here are some of the principles um, behind community-based particip participatory research, which I've um, already alluded to. Um, so recognizing the community, building um, the strengths, um, building on strengths and resources within the community. This is uh, what I would call a, using a, um, an asset model, not just a deficit model. Like even, you know, this, is, this isn't just a, a problem issue. What are the resources that the community brings uh, potentially in, in addressing or attempting to address a, a specific issue, uh, promoting co-learning and uh, using an empowering process. Capacity building is really, really important for sustainability. And then the growth, really discovery isn't a, a one-off you know, activity. Research and discovery builds upon itself year after year, decade after decade. And if communities are partners within that process, um, they too are building. Um, and this term that that is it is kind of being used, but the citizen scientists, for example, and the appreciation for science and the value for science is all being influenced within that process um, as, as we engage individuals more. So when I talked about um, some specific principles that can be used for community-engaged research, this is a, an example on how you um, how you what kinds of principles you would take into consideration. One of my students, uh, Christine Hitella, gets full credit for creating this wonderful slide for one of the classes that I teach on uh, community-engaged research, which focuses on these principles. But before the work begins, the, you know, clarifying the purpose and the goals with the population, um, knowing the community, right? This, you know, typically researchers uh, start engaging research uh, or, or the community, if it's gonna be a community-engaged study, they start approaching them like once the grant announcement comes out and they have two or three weeks or maybe if they're lucky, a couple of months to get the, the grant ready. Well, that's way too late. You should have made those friends and get to know the community that you want to work with months or years before that. Um, once you kind of get going, um, using uh, or working with those established relations, you know, establishing the clear relationships and commitments, really respecting collective self-determination. This is This is a when you have true partnerships, all these community-based participatory research principles, this is going to be one of the key things, right? That that you respect the self-determination of what the community is saying, and your interests. Hopefully, you know you were working with them way uh, early, um, so that you were on the same page. But unfortunately, like I said, often you you get into these relationships and they're not very solid, and all of this kind of goes to the wayside. Um, and then for success. The partnering, recognizing the diversity, working with assets in the community, being flexible, um, and, and, and the researcher potentially releasing control in terms of what's happening, and then thinking about the long-term commitment, the sustainability. There's a lot of detail that goes into a lot of this, but you, know, you get a sense of, of the full gamut of, of what community-engaged work uh, can bring and what it takes in terms of um, time and building trust and those elements. Here's an example um, at the Morris Cancer Center, um, MCC, the Morris Cancer Center. Um, one of the clinical trials approaches that, that we're using that takes a lot of this into consideration. In therapeutic trials in particular, you do need a, a systematic approach and you do need and want leadership support. You want center-wide policy behind that support. We want to increase, for example, Hispanic um, numbers, if they're low in terms of a specific disease team, you know, breast, lung, cancer, head and neck, you know, in, in the cancer world, the oncologists, the specialists are kind of, they focus on their disease site. 
Um, and, and, and they're doing trials, right? And they have the clinical trials office has um, support for a lot of these things. But what do those numbers look like in terms of the, the involvement of certain populations and so on? So involving, um, having center-wide policy, having an infrastructure. And at the clinic level, at the clinician level, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? What's the patient-provider relationship, patient-specific uh, cancer treatment options? What's that provider encounter look like? And I'll, get, I'll give a little more detail in terms of, you know, how you would address that in a cultural and language concordant way with the ultimate goal of increasing clinical trial accrual among the given diverse population that you're trying to work with. Um, so in this, in this example of the clinical trial at the practice level, the, the recommendations there, these should kind of sound familiar based on what I've been saying, language and cultural concordant staff and study team, right? If you're gonna be recruiting individuals from a given culture or with a given language, well, you wanna have language, you know, staff that have that, that the materials that you're using have been adapted, not just translated, but adapted to um, to, to, to those cultures, the, the study consents in particular, any study information and so on. The cultural competency that's required to work with these communities. There are certain communities or immigrants, for example, that just defer to physicians. They basically say, you know, it's not uncommon to generalize a little bit, but it's not uncommon uh, for less acculturated uh, Latinos to basically just defer to the, the physician, si doctor, si doctora, you know, whatever you say, that's what I want to do. Um, and the clinician, you know, that's not, that's not a, 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 you know, basically a, a mutual decision. That's like, tell me what to do. And, and that's not what, what it's about, right, in terms of this work. But you can see some of these examples um, uh, very much relate to those items that I've talked about. So in summary, we can help meet the challenges of addressing uh, key health disparities in research participation by actively inc including communities and potential study participants early and often. This is the whole community engaged research, building those capacities uh, at both the academic side and with the community partners. And just being very cognizant that, uh, particularly as you know, the, the left-hand circle of those principles where we were talking about getting to know the community, well, Get to know the community way before you start thinking about your research. That takes time. But that yields immense, immense advantages with regards to building trust, uh, building understanding, right? Um, and that also helps inform what your partnered leadership should look like, right? It's not just the investigators on the academic side, but the investigators from the community side being part of that team throughout and being at the highest levels. Um, compensation. The folks don't and shouldn't work for free. Uh, participants, you know, you do have this potential for undue influence as you give incentive to participants, but certainly the staff in, in, in your community partnership um, that are helping you recruit, retain, and then with the dissemination, you know, they, they should be compensated for that. And then the practice dissemination that I talked about is so important to gather information, uh, not just your study findings, but the process itself to put it in, um, in, 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 in word um, levels um, that are understandable and easy consumable, and also in vehicles that are appropriate, not necessarily PowerPoints, right? It, it might be uh, social media and um, common language summaries and, and those kinds of things. And then from the very beginning, um, because as I said, um, science and research is iterative and, 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 and really progressive, you want to talk about long-term relationships and what's the sustainability, not just of, uh, of the relationship or, or, or the, the, the program that you're trying to, to develop, um, that that kind of gets implemented somewhere, but that, um, that everything grows upon itself and, um, and, and it's a partnership, right? And so that's very, very important. Um, so thank you so much for the, for the opportunity. I look forward to a, a very robust conversation. Thank you, Jesse. That was, that was excellent. I um, much appreciated. And so many of our programs this year, so much of our conversation, everybody's conversations this year have been about COVID-19. And we know that there are um, all sorts of reasons that there are disparities in the impact of the disease in the impact uh, in the differences in people's willingness and ability to get the vaccine. So 
could you speak a little bit to um, the importance of what you're doing to address those issues? What what would change by what you're doing? Um, what might we hope for in an aspirational way that would be possible? For those of us doing population-based research, we were quickly pulled in to, in to address uh, some of the issues related to disparities for, for COVID specifically. Uh, I'm actually a, a lead investigator on, um, on a large national Institutes of Health grant uh, under this infrastructure called RADx Up, which is uh, rapid assessment and diagnostics. And the Up is a, a, a subgroup of grants called uh, focused on underserved populations. And um, I have other colleagues um, that are part of the call, or at least they were part of the call earlier. Dr. Corinne McDaniels Davidson uh, at San Diego State is also part of a very another RADx Up grant with uh, San Diego State, and. Basically, those of us who have been doing population engaged work were already kind of clued in and had partnerships, in, in, in my case, um, with community health centers. If you're not familiar with community health centers or federally qualified health centers, th these are the, the settings uh, where, where poor folks uh, on the federal insurance side, Medi-Cal or Medicaid everywhere outside of California, uh, get their primary care. And um, in, in our area, about 67% of the patients there are of Hispanic descent in terms of culture, 99% um, are in poverty and so on and so forth. So um, those of us who have been working with those populations uh, and the relationships that we have, we're kind of poised to continue those relationships to look at specific areas, in our case, um, testing. And uh, you know, ironically, within four or five months, we have pretty much shifted away from testing and over into vaccination. Um, so the information that we're gathering, uh, really is going to be like the next wave of testing. So it's sustained testing. So, um, teams or, or scientists that were more population centric, I think had an advantage in, in, a, in working with and addressing, uh, in this case, COVID specific disparities. Yeah, I was, I was, that, that, that's a very important part of the story. I was thinking about another aspect though as well, which is, is the research itself. I mean, why, uh, there, there's reason to believe based on what we've been seeing that sis, a systemic history of the way different communities have been dealt with means that some communities are at more risk of illness and we just haven't done the research to be able to know what we should be doing. And as, um, so, I mean, and, you know, examples in some fields include the fact that the um, someone's racial history might mean a difference in responsiveness to certain drugs or increased risks of certain diseases. And yet those groups have not been part of the research. Yeah. Again, uh, one of the comments that I made is that as individuals, we we usually um, feel the most comfortable around our own groups, quite frankly. Uh, linguistically, culturally, and so on. And researchers aren't any different. So if um, if you're um, of a certain gender or of a certain racial ethnic group, you language, for example, I think language is actually quite a, quite, quite a good example. Um, most of us are kind of used to functioning in English, right? So working with individuals that don't speak our language or are of a significantly different culture, is a little bit more difficult. And, and quite frankly, that's what's happened historically. I mean, if you think of um, the capacity, that's setting aside the just straight out racism, <laughs> which is, is very real, quite frankly, um, or sexism in some cases, right? Uh, right now, for example, we have certain subpopulations, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, individuals that are not binary, you know, binary gender wise, in other words, man, male or female. And there are so few researchers or uh, self-identified researchers that are of that population or um, have really worked with that population that it's even difficult to know what language to use. For those of us outside of the SOGI community, we, you know, slowly in the last year and a half, you've been seeing the, 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 the pronoun, right? Oh, here's my pronoun. He, she, you know, he, she, they, them, and so on. And it's starting to raise consciousness about that specific population. But it, that's kind of what seems like an almost an extreme example. But um, as, as a researcher, 
if if you don't even have the, the vocabulary or or you don't know how to work with those populations, the research isn't going to get done with those populations. So I think that's kind of one example. Good, thanks. So we have a question in the chat um, about how you how you find the communities pertin pertinent to your research, um, and I. I, I think there's a lot of ways you could go with this, but specifically, um, the individual is, is interested in the problem that often ethnic communities uh, along certain boundaries are often very politically divided. And so I don't know whether you've addressed that sort of question in your own research or thinking. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's as much the political division issue as it is that as researchers, one of the things that the whole research enterprise forces you to do, particularly the funders, whether it's federal funders like the National Institutes of Health or, um, or other organizations. In my case, um, for example, in cancer, I do cancer prevention research. The American Cancer Society is a, is a very significant funder. And then you have uh, other nonprofits. What happens in research is that by design, you are very, very narrow um, because the way that things are laid out is you have a question and you have a hypothesis on what you think the answer to that question is, and then you develop specific aims on what, it, you know, what information you're going to collect to answer that question. So you're fairly narrow. And, and once you have a, a narrow area, um, you, you know, it, it isn't that difficult to figure out what kind of, of, of populations, if you're, if you're dealing with, um, with um, human participants, you're going to go work with. So I'll give you an example um, in my case. So I focus not just on individuals, um, individuals as in patients, for example, but um, the individuals who serve them. So clinicians and also the leadership within the structures that serve them. So administrators within clinics. So my focus area is cancer prevention. And in cancer prevention, if you go to the screening side, there are really three, only three cancers that we screen for systematically. And we all know what they are. They're basically breast, mammography, colorectal cancer. It's either going to be a fecal test or a colonoscopy or cervical cancer. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's basically going to be a pap or an HPV test. So in my world, it's like those three things. And it crosses both genders, right? Um, but so, so, so the populations, and, and, and I, I narrow it down even further, right? I'm interested in working with underserved or poor populations. Where do those screenings happen? They happen in these uh, primary care settings, in our case, called community health centers. That's for poor people, that's primarily where they happen. So now I'm, I'm basically narrowed down. Let's say I'm focusing on colorectal, which is the area I work on. So that's both genders. Um, so there's not a gender thing. If I were doing cervical, it's women. So this is just an example of how things kind of get whittled down into these groupings. Once you know those groupings, well, in my case, it's colorectal, so it's both genders. It's poor folks, so it's community health centers. Um, and and that's, that's kind of my universe. In San Diego County, there's an umbrella organization for most of the 17 community health centers, Health Quality Partners. Um, so I'm going to go make friends with them. And, and there are, are, I'm going to go to the, the databases that talk about those uh, community health centers. There's a, an, there's a web page because they're all funded by um, the Health Resources Services Administration, HRSA, and they have data on them. And I'm going to look at the characteristics of these specific health centers. And by the way, if I were specifically interested in racial, you know, in um, Asian Pacific Islanders, for example, there are a couple of health centers that focus on that. Operation Samahan, for example, or San Isidro Health, which has significant Asian Pacific Islander populations. Or in the north, you know, the largest Asian Pacific Islander or the largest Asian population in our county is Filipinos, right? So where, where do they live? Historically, they lived in the National City. Now they've kind of moved up uh, over into the Bernardo area. So you just kind of look at what the data are. You, you go to those uh, sites and you start making friends, as I mentioned in my talk, preferably way before you start writing any grants. Yeah, no, this, this, is, this is really important. And... Um... It, you, know, it, you know, it's it's easy to see how important this is to have the right people involved and making sure that we have the full spectrum of the community involved in research. And it seems self-evident that we should hear the voices of the people who will be asked to participate in the research, that we should be engaging the right ones. But um, as, as you noted, um, 
um, it's clear a study with participants, for example, who are women or Latinos, that they should have a role in, in that. But it also seems obvious to me that some identities might be more important than others, depending on the question you're asking. So that might vary depending on the focus of the research, but how should we think about choosing which identities are most important? So, for example, there's a lot of conversation right now about racial identity. Um, there's a, been a lot of conversation for some time about gender, and both are clearly important. But I could imagine other kinds of identities, like being a single parent or economic circumstances that might be important. So, so how should we think about that? Who makes the decision about which identities we should be worrying about that might be underrepresented? There are um, well-proven frameworks or structures. One of the, the, the broadest ones is called the social determinants of health. Um, and honestly, Europe has been ahead of us uh, on that. Michael Marmot, for example, Dr. Marmot, uh, who has been a champion for, if you wanna keep a population healthy, get those people jobs, number one. That's, that's kind of an adage there. In, in demography, when I was at Cornell back in the 80s, uh, one of the things that I learned in demography is if, if you want to keep the birth rate down, what's the number one thing you, you can do? Educate women. <laughs> Educate women. That's how you keep the birth rate down. Um, so those are like at, at the higher level, the social determinants of health, employment, um, um, health indicators, and so on. You can begin to come down and look at other types of frameworks, like the socio-ecological model that, that, that looks at, uh, at, at various growing circles, starting with the individual and what are the characteristics of the individual and then going to the family and then the neighborhood and so on. And, and you basically go all the way up to society. And um, you know these identities or these important um, uh, variables, as it were, within each of those levels, I, you know, contribute to the ultimate impact, which is somebody's health, and whether there's an inequity or a disparity in terms of uh, a specific group of people. And the, the, the truth is that we know the answers to a lot of things. We don't have the political will in some cases, or in other cases, um, the, the true leadership that's needed to put the resources and put the emphasis on the things that are most important. And I'll give you an example, and this is the area that I work in, prevention. Our society here in the US is, is basically disease driven uh, in terms of health. It isn't health, it's disease driven. And, and we're driven towards curative medicine, not prevention. There are countries that have emphasized prevention, Australia, New Zealand, for example, on the cancer front. One of the best things that we can do to prevent six different cancers, starting with cervical cancer, is get everybody vaccinated for human papillomavirus. There are countries like Australia, politically, financially, have put their resources in, and they've reached levels of 70, 75% coverage, and they are beginning to see the disappearance of precancerous HPV-associated disease. That's an example of a priority area that was a disparity where resources were correctly applied and you reduce that disparity or eliminate it. In this country, we know what the problems are. We know what the solutions are. We just don't apply them. Okay, so well, that begs the question then. So what, what should, you know, what would you um, invite the audience to do? How do we fix this? What, is this an education <laughs> issue? Is it a voting let me issue? Get, yeah, let me is get it... political. How do we get Trump in office? <laughs> and how do, how do we get rid of Trump? Uh, you know, it's the exact same thing. Look, folks who have been around for a while, they know somebody called Saul Alinsky, for example, and I'll show, I'll show my leftward leaning in terms of politics, but, or Pablo Freire, for example. Um, these are individuals um, who, who have basically shown us the importance of the individual or groups of individuals, uh, Margaret Mead, I think the saying is, uh, there's only one thing that has changed the world and it's, you know, uh, two organized people or whatever, I can't remember the exact saying, but the way you get things done is you basically have a group of individuals who, or who are on course and stay on course for a extended period, of, for an extended period of time on a specific issue. And in our society, um, 
the big issues, quite frankly, are solved through our elected officials. But unfortunately, our you know our elected system has a lot of challenges, um, and and that just is propagated throughout the world, right? Um, you know, we say or we feel that democracy is the best way to go, and blah blah blah. But um, it's interesting because, like I said, there are other countries in the health arena who have much, much better policies than us and have much, much healthier populations because of the decisions that they made. And that's because individuals got into it. And, and, but more importantly, those individuals were able to influence their, their leadership you know, at the municipal, the county, or the, you know, the national level to make these tough decisions and, and make the correct investments. Great. Thanks. So we've got a couple. I've I've got more questions, but we've got a couple of others from um, the audience. I want to go through those. Um, so someone says they're they are on the organizational training and enrichment work stream of the anti racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion task force, which is a long name. What kinds of and they're asking what kinds of training would best prepare our research workforce for engaging in culturally humble community partnerships? Well. Uh, that's what I'm trying to develop, quite frankly, uh, under the Altman Clinical and Translational Research Institute. But one of the things in the presentation that I talked about were these principles for community engagement or this model of community-based participatory research. Those are frameworks and models that have the key elements and they're, and they're specifically geared towards academics. But that's only half of the equation. And, and when I say academics, I'm not talking about just professors, just faculty. I'm talking about the staff that work with them, the students that they're training. So it's the entire academic enterprise that's gonna be involved in discovery. And, but the flip side of that is the capacity building with community partners. The, you know, the community partner, in order for them to say, in order for them to know what the most important thing is when it comes to research, the most important thing in research is the research question and the study aims that follow. That guides everything else. So the, the community really should understand that that is the most important thing, and number one. And number two, well, how, how do we contribute to those research questions and those aims? How do we become an active partner? Remember the right-hand side of the, of the community-based participatory model, the active partner, the true partner? And how do we ensure that of this multi-million dollar, dollar grant, that we're being compensated so that our time is, 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 is in fact part of that enterprise. Now, having said all this, part of the problem that we have in, in academia and in research is that the current funders and the current research models that we have do not lend themselves to this partnership very well. Part of it is the timing. Part of it is um, the fact that it's coming to academic institutions. They're not really set up. You know, the academic institution then sets up the contract for the money transfer with everybody else and so on and so forth. There are a couple of mechanisms out there that try to do a better job with that. For example, PCORI, Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute funding. But even there, I can tell you that it, it's, not, it's not quite there. I think we have a little ways to go and, and it's an entire structure kind of thing. This one is, uh, this, this next one is, um, they're saying the science behind what you do is a mystery that deters people from participating. I'm gonna broaden that. I think they're arguing that the science behind what we in academia are doing is a mystery to people. They are afraid. Yeah. You provide basic information about the medical issue and what you are planning to do. Example at hand is the COVID vaccine. People don't know what clinical trials are, therefore do not associate them with why it is known the vaccine is safe. Yeah, so let me, let me tell you this. Um, no, when I say the capacity building of the community side, you know, to get in, in, in there and do this and do that, there are certain things that we have to be very realistic about. And that is the, 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 the years that it takes to become a scientist, right? Uh, my path. So four years undergrad, two years master's, four years doctorate, that's 10 years outside of high school to, 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 to do research and, and do this and do that. Well, somebody who, even with an undergrad degree, um, they're not going to get the that you know that level of research capacity. So there, there does have to be. There are certain components or certain pieces that um, that are going to distinguish um, the the um, the general public 
or non-trained individuals from trained individuals. And, but, but so that, that piece of it is very real. But I tell you where, where scientists drop the ball is, is not, and I try to, to show that in, in the presentations when I was talking about the dissemination side, where we have a huge infrastructure to how to present our findings to our, to our colleagues, right? That's the scientific meetings and manuscripts. But having a dialogue with non-scientists is something that we don't get any training in. And part of your question, I think, revolves around this transfer of information and, um, and having a common knowledge to work with non-scientists. And that's very, very important. And I think also part of the capacity is the ability to do that. And not, you know, if you're a Homer Simpson fan or a Simpsons fan, it's not dumbing it down, right? It's basically speaking in common language. And quite frankly, as a scientist, I will tell you that a person who can explain a very um, complex concept to you in simple ways is a person who understands what the hell they're talking about. Um, and, and the best scientists can do that, or, you know, that, that are truly translational. Good, thank you. Um, someone um, has cited an organization called the uh, Trust for America's Health. Um, and although I don't know something to validate the numbers, the numbers make sense to me from things I've heard. Um, and they're quoting, in 2018, public health spending amounted to approximately $286 per person just 3% of all healthcare spending in the country. Investment in public health programs saves money by preventing injury and illness, which is particularly important as the population ages. Um, and I, I take that to be a plug for saying, prevention is better than waiting until the problem has occurred. And yet, as you've noted, that's not where we go. So any more thoughts on how we well, move in the right direction? Yeah, politically and clinically, there's a reason for why we don't uh, why our health systems don't invest in prevention? Um, they have a vest, uh, you know, they have a vested interest. Say uh, Kaiser or Sharp or our UC Healthcare, um, th they have patients that they invest in, or insurance companies have patients that they invest in. And if they invest a ton in, in prevention, those patients, the benefits are really more at a societal level rather than at the health plan level. Kaiser is particularly good because they actually do more prevention than just about anybody else. Um, but they also have ways of enticing their patients so that they stick around, so that they actually see the benefit of that. And some of the most important things that we can do, um, the big three, for example, on the prevention side, tobacco, eating well, staying fit, right? Um, those three risk factors account for the four most common diseases everywhere, right? So everything from cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, um, and and, and, and those diseases cause fit half of the death everywhere. Here, uh, New York, uh, the rest of the world, uh, in some places you have more infectious disease, but at the end of the day, it's a chronic disease issue. Um, if we had um, leadership at, that would get behind kind of the whole global movement of addressing some of these issues, uh, with prevention, I think we would be much farther ahead. And quite frankly, the COVID, the COVID uh, pandemic is an example. Just think of if we were to attack obesity in the way that we've attacked COVID, right? Um, <laughs> globally, right? With, with inoculation vaccines, which by the way, the inoculation vaccines for obesity are directly tied in with our industrial food complex. What do I mean by that? Well, we have very, in the US, we have very high calorie dense food and it's particularly marketed in poor and underserved communities. Fast food, right? Um, and, and the marketing and engineering company and the marketing companies know that sweet, salty um, and sugary are what attracts our palate. And therefore for the kids, it's cereal on the, on the commercials and blah, blah, blah. For us, it's the Big Mac and the fries, and we go there, we go there. And it's supersized, so the portions are even bigger. So if we were to attack obesity the way we attack COVID, we would have to deal with, the, with what we're doing at a national level with the food complex, and we'd have to deal with us moving away from prepared food to creating our own food, right? So you know, to, to making our own food, to cooking our own food, and, and so on, and eating less food. 
So those are, you know, just a lot of complexities there, but, you know, it, it's part of it on the prevention side. Thanks. Um, I'd like to um, try this experiment that we uh, talked about doing this evening, which is to uh, try some breakout rooms again. Um, we um, are trying to set up several breakout rooms. I believe it's seven. Um, and for each breakout room, um, we have hopefully successfully asked someone if they would be willing to take the lead on facilitating the discussion. And the question I have in mind, and, and Jesse, you should feel free. I'm, I'm doing this based on what where the conversation has gone so far, but I'm thinking of, of asking the groups to come up with their suggestions about how researchers can best engage with the community. And specifically, the things to think about would be, well, who speaks for a community? Is it their elected leaders? Is it those who speak most loudly? Is it those who have the most education and ability to speak? Um, does anyone, and, and, and corollary to that is, does anyone really speak for a community? So the, the challenge, the general challenge would be to say, is to come up with ideas about how researchers should be engaging with the community. We'd like to hear back from the groups now on what you thought were some ways that you would like your communities to be engaged. Um, and in the hope that you did identify a spokesperson, um, let's start with group one. Janelle, yeah. can you, what, did, what did you guys come up with? Yeah, so we talked about a couple different things, but just really quickly, we talked first about showing up for the community and doing that consistently um, and regularly. And you know that might look like different things depending on the community, but really offering your services and having really pure intentions and not just doing it in order to like in, in, in order to get to an end, but to actually benefit the community as well. And then we also just talked about kind of the challenge of the grant funding models and how it can make it difficult to really invest long term in a community when so many grants are just funded for short periods of time and with very specific um, stipulations for how that money is being used, which can make it hard to really benefit the community and address the social determinants of health, um, which might make longer term impacts. Thank you. Um, so Jesse, I should ask for each of these if you have any further comments on, on what the group came up with. And um, No, I, I just said I think those are spot on. And, and obviously, you have um, some expertise. Uh, once you start using the social determinants of health, that you know you have folks that, that know what they're talking about. So, so uh, room two, that I think Mitz was the um, uh, facilitator of that group. So who is the... Uh, who's uh, the I'll, I'll just Hi, Michael. I'll, I'll just make some comments. The our group felt that you know, indeed, there. It all depends, but but communities do have uh, uh, networks. They could be based on uh, churches or places where people gather. Uh, people have their own what dialects, their own uh, uh, activities, fun things, whatever is that then build uh, natural networks. And so this idea of representing a community. Well, no, don't. It 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 really de it really depends upon how those communities are already kind of networked, and uh, that, that can be around again food or, or or community organizations. Good, thanks, Mitz. Um, so, room um, three, um, maybe you can sort of summarize where you were going with uh, your your answer. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm kind of new getting into research, um, going into a PhD program, but one thing that comes to mind is um, that since I'm a member of, you know, I'm of a community where most of the research is done, um, yet interested in doing um, research with a disadvantaged or minority populations, um, I would need to find members of the research team that are representative of that group. Um, Mm -hmm. and to make sure that they're a part of the team because they are going to be the ones who are going to be most well-versed in engaging that community. Um, there's no way I could do it without that kind of support. Um, we did have another member who, who does work on community engagement and they reach out to veterans and um, through case management, AA meetings, NAMI kind of places um, where veterans tend to 
maybe congregate, they also use resources like Mama's Kitchen or um, 211 even. Good. Thanks. And, you know, part of what you were getting into is, is what um, I envisioned we might do with this question is instead of thinking about what would that group over there want to be engaged is to think for yourselves. In other words, what, what would you be looking for? What would matter to you? Um, and, and Mary, you've made, I, if I understood correctly, you made the point that um, you'd want someone who was like you in the sense of identity, whatever identities you might have, if, because mm -hmm. if they're absent from that group, then you might feel that um, they just don't know who you are. Well, absolutely. I think that that's how any group would feel. They misunderstood. Or, okay. or so um, that's the yeah. irony, irony of this is that that's how so much science has been done <laughs> precisely in that way. So, yeah. And I did appreciate what um, I'm not sure who who said it, but um, having peer intentions, you know, I think that um, what we see in minority communities is that the researchers are often white and middle class and scientists and um we have a history of, of not doing good, you know, equitable research that's beneficial to the community and, and maybe even abusive. So um, we need to back back away from that. Jesse, I mean, something just on, on that, I mean, I think I should turn that to you a bit. I mean, there is this. Yeah, history. well, um, what do we do about that? <laughs> you know, recently, you know, white males are, are the devil, right? You know, way before Malcolm X started. Uh, and the nation of Islam started, oh, you know, white populations of the devil. Um, here's the truth. The truth is that the inequity is almost within the research enterprise because of the separation that it creates and, and these models that I was talking about as academics and, you know, that we're in that structure that almost forces us to work in a certain way. And the... I totally agree with you, Mary. The, this whole issue of, of addressing diversity, you know, most of us tend to automatically go to like the racial ethnic, right? But regardless of what you're doing, it's so important to meet, to involve individuals of the group that you're working with. And it may be race, it may be age, it may be geographic location, um, it may be having a certain asset or having a certain deficit. And um, so it's not just about, you know, the whole racial ethnic, you know, the, 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 when you think disparity or diversity, you, you think about that. Um, it's these all, all these other complexities. Um, and again, having individuals, as you, as you mentioned, Mary, having individuals on the team that have, have worked or are, are of those populations or of those communities or of those groups is, is very important. And, and not just having, their, uh, having them there as tokens, right? But having these folks actively involved, preferably in leadership positions. And, but here's the thing. The thing is that you don't see, there aren't a lot of bilingual, bicultural researchers you know, on the Hispanic side. Um, if you look at UCSD right now and you look at the folks that are in leadership, you have a lot of East Indians, for example, a lot of East Indians clinicians, a lot of East Indian um, clinicians in rural areas. And they're of a different culture than Latinos or Hispanics. There are some things that are similar, but there are many things that are different. And if those individuals are leading that research, are they more or less likely to bring in research teams that are of uh, let's say Hispanic culture, you'd have to look at the makeup of those teams. Um, but my point is that at, at certain levels, there are just less and less people to pick from. But then again, there's no excuse. I mean, why would you not have in, in a Southern California region, border region, why would you not have staffs that are fully bilingual and bicultural, having so many people with the bilingual bicultural side that can be trained and, and increased you know, that you increase that capacity. Why would you not have that, right? Um, those are some of the realities that, that, that are there. Yeah, uh, so it, it's another thing that, you know, begs the question of, so what, what can we and what should we do about this? How do we change that? 
Um, I'm going to leave that as a rhetorical question for right now. So let's move to uh, room four. Um, so Sarah uh, Burke was, I believe, the facilitator. Um, who's going to speak up for that group? Uh, uh, hi, Mike. They actually yes, asked sorry. me to do it. <laughs> so um, like group two, we were kind of interested in this question of who gets to speak for the community or which is what it, where is the community that we're trying to get access to. And one of the things that we thought is that maybe the health center is not necessarily the only way or the best way to do it. And particularly for reasons of patient confidentiality and other kinds of issues around how patients are handled. But ideas that came out from our group are faith groups, councils on aging and rec centers, which are direct, uh, providing direct services to the community. We also were interested in mums groups and caregivers as potential community resources that are available and are overlooked all the time in terms of what the community is thinking or where their concerns lie. Again, you know, this whole narrow focus of research and the work you're doing is going to point you in one direction or the other, unless it happens to be a topic that is so broad that anyone can participate. I'll give you an example of that uh, movement, right? Physical activity. And, and you can focus that in, but uh, on the broader social determinants side of things for the socio-ecological model, there's, there's a science called built environment, which is uh, related to movement, if you want people to move, you don't focus on the individual as much as you focus on their immediate surroundings. How do you entice them to want to get out there and walk? So parks, right? Sidewalks, um, safe crossings of streets. Here, here in San Diego, we have this ongoing, I, I live in the North Park, South Park area, and there's this ongoing battle of, of getting rid of parking to put in bike lanes and this, that, and the other. Um, so if you have a big, broad issue like that, you know, it could, but, you know, you want to take advantage of all these different networks and, and, and coalitions and groups, not necessarily just for the, you know, the biking piece, but the movement. Um, water, you know, water quality, water taste would be another one that would air, air quality, uh, and so on. And, the, you know, these are the kinds of things that it's really interesting because technology, um, wearables and sensors and this and that and our phones, um, I think our phones, for example, are a real interesting tool now for traffic or, or built-in navigate. All the new cars have built-in navigation that have all these pop-ups usually linked to your phone. These are, these are examples of how, you know, you don't even need to talk to people as much as, as having this technology linked in so that people can put in the information and then it goes out broadly. I think these are the, the enablers now that, that potentially facilitate not only information collection, you know, to get input from folks, but um, massive information on entire regions that can then shape decisions. So I think all of those pieces are, are important. So uh, th thank you, Sarah. And, and by the way, just for the record, Sarah was one of the basically co-founders of the Ethics Center, worked with us for um, quite a few years at the beginning, um, and then abandoned us for San Francisco. So I'm going to move on now. So we Got to finish up. So we'll need to be brief. So room five, um, anything you can add that we haven't heard already? Um, who's going to be the spokesperson? Um, this, Mike, it's Rachel. Hi, Rachel. And I, I took a lot of notes. And so I guess I'm going to be the spokesperson because I have uh, the notes. Um, <laughs> similar things, but I thought it was very interesting um, how the people and in the, in the individuals in this group defined community. One of them was um, a definition of community as a collective voice uh, in, in the, and in the sense of leadership, um, uh, the collective voice and, and the stakeholder uh, independent of special interest groups. Um, so, um, and I'm not doing justice to the, the discussion because we, you know, we ran out of time to discuss it. And I think another uh, interesting point that came out, some, uh, someone earlier mentioned natural networks. One of the members here who's traveled a lot has observed that communities are, are not necessarily um, of ethnicity or more minorities as, as was just recently met, mentioned, uh, but rather it was a function of diverse individuals that for 
for whatever reason, ended up living in close proximity to one another. So a proximity-based community um, that, um, that, uh, that is a, a composed of, di of diverse, uh, diverse in individuals. Uh, we didn't get very uh, far into the discussion of who would be the leaders of, of this thing. One of the things about the, pro uh, excuse me, the pro proximity-based uh, community is that they begin to think alike just uh, because they are together. Uh, we didn't get into, like I said, leadership of, of what that type of group would be like. And just to wrap it up in terms of the ethnicity minority, which we tend to, as Dr. Uh, Nadora mentioned, we tend to think of those uh, first, uh, uh, leadership in those areas are very frequently um, elders or uh, religious leaders um, and, and such. So I just thought that everyone is pretty much talked about the same thing, the terminology a little bit different. And I found it particularly interesting, the, uh, the descriptions of what community is, what, um, uh, what communities are in uh, the um, descriptions that were contributed by the members of this particular group. And we would have we would have been able to use a lot more time to get it a okay, little bit so, more into the yeah, detail. We, 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 we knew everybody needed three more minutes. And At least. Be... <laughs> <laughs> At so, least yeah. three more minutes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for those those thoughtful comments about community and defining what that is. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, we don't have a lot of time left, but if you want to comment briefly on that before we go to room six, which was your room. No, um, I, I think that's absolutely right in terms of, um, you know, community is such a such an expansive uh, term and and the reality is that for certain things it can be formally defined uh particularly public health uh and, but for other things it could be extremely nebulous um i really do like the 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 grouping you know of collective voices um and and it just depends on what you're working on right um uh, sometimes it could be a small, a small grouping of, of individuals, or, or it could be millions. So yeah, it's it, it's quite quite broad. If you're looking to make su sustained impact uh, and looking towards policy, right, uh, advocacy for policy specifically, how how do you go about that, and um, and at what level? And, and I think that's that's a talk onto itself, quite frankly. And I will say this: public health. Training rarely includes advocacy, which is ironic, right? Because at the end of the day, public health is about populations and it, sh and it, and it is like shaping and influencing health in populations. And the best way to do that, quite frankly, is via policy, via societal um, action. Yet the, that, that advocacy part isn't really emphasized. And then the other thing is most scientists shy away from getting involved politically because of independence, right, for, for your evidence and so on. But those are, those are kind of some, some ironic pieces uh, in, in, in the area that we've been talking about. That sounds like a topic for a session on its own is that tension between being independent and objective and being the scientist yeah. and recognizing that if policies aren't addressing what we know about how these issues are, are dealt with in the communities that, that we are, are gonna do we're going to do damage. We aren't just not going to help. We're going to yeah. do damage. Right? Yeah, it's kind of ironic that uh, that most scientists turn to politics in old age, right? You think of Einstein and you know, no nukes and you know, <laughs> that. Yeah, it's just what happens. But at a young age, you can't afford to do those things. Like exactly. So we we, exactly. we need to wrap up here soon. So so um so very briefly, room seven. Who's the spokesperson? That was Lisa. Was I was Eiler was the. Uh, leader of that group, facilitator. Earl, did you want to say a few things? Yeah, yes. Um, we also um, talked about identifying trusted community leaders as a first step and mentioned many of those that other groups have. Um, but one that's uh, maybe a little bit different is also finding um, any philanthropic groups in the community. And um, and also looking at community newspapers, blogs, podcasts, uh, other, other uh, communications that might help you identify some of the community leaders. And then we moved on to um, talking about 
um, really how to engage in the community by spending uh, time and getting to know the community, um, holding open forums and having discussions, really fact finding with members of the community, um, you know, approaching a, a different uh, uh, services, maybe uh, food banks, other community services, um, you know, different ways of how you even uh, uh, through the leaders or um, other organizations that you find uh, members of the community who would be willing to engage with the researchers. And finally, we spoke about um, really learning um, and following what the speaker had to say about clear communication using plain language and getting to know the uh, language of the community uh, and not using the, the jargon and the language of the, uh, of the professionals that uh, uh, may not be uh, clearly understood. And not only asking the questions about what the community wants, but also what would be, um, what, what would be turnoffs um, that the researcher might not have an understanding um, that would be uh, um, not welcomed by the community and acknowledging uh, past um, ethical abuses that often make members of the community fearful of science. Thank you, Carol. That was a really rich addition to what we, we already had. So thank you very Wonderful. much for that. And we unfortunately are actually um, past our closed time of seven o'clock. And we, as I've always said in the past, have an ethical responsibility to finish on time. I want to really thank Jesse for extraordinarily important topic and discussion. Um, and, I, and what I see is a field which um, has a lot of opportunity to uh, sharpen our thinking, to do better, and to maybe um, help change some policies that, that are getting in the way of, of good science and good health. Um, so Jesse, thank you very much. You're I welcome. want to thank the audience for your participation this evening. Um, I really appreciate the, the work you did in the small groups. And I also felt I'm going to take the liberty of, of being the, uh, the moderator for the program this evening, of using this opportunity to let you know, for those of you who have any interest at all, that um, I am retiring July 1st. We will have a new director for the Ethics Center effective July 1. And that's George, Dr. George Hightower, who is part of the program this evening. Um, I will, um, at the very least, um, listen in on future programs. But I want to thank those of you who have been with us for many programs in the past and wish you all a good evening. Mm -hmm.